Good to see you. I'm Philip Price. I think I know most of you. If I don't, I'd, I'd love to know you, and uh, hope uh, I get a chance to, to visit with you soon. But uh, Brother Steve's taking some well-deserved vacation, and so we want to pray for him. And doesn't that building look good out there? Yeah. Isn't it great to see a roof on it? That's cool. That's really cool. We're making progress, so we continue to pray. The Lord's will be done and all the aspects of that, and um, we're just so, so thankful for what we've seen so far. And I know uh, uh, Brother Steve would want me to say this, too. Just thank you for your faithful giving and praying, and, uh, and the Lord will have, it'll be completed in His time, right? <laughs> in His time. Uh, we're going to look at James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And we're going to uh, think on uh, being humble enough to be joyful. Humble enough to be joyful. Humble enough to be joyful. James 1, verses 1 through 8. And the scripture says this, this, this letter from James. James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Verse 6 of James 1. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. There was once a guy that had a, a medium-sized hardware store. He received some bad news. There was going to be a Walmart moved right next door to him. It was going to share a wall of his store. That was bad enough. And then later, a short time after that, he heard the news, a target was going to come and share the other wall. And of course, his employees, everybody was so concerned. What are we going to do? Walmart sells hardware. Target sells hardware. How can we ever compete? So he was worried when he went home that night. And as he was trying to you can imagine he wasn't sleeping. He was rolling around in the bed trying to figure out what was he going to do. How could he take on those big boys that moved in? Um, something hit him. A great idea hit him. It was like a eureka. And, he, and, he, and he, he couldn't believe it. He was so excited he couldn't sleep. He really couldn't sleep then for a good reason. So he got up the next morning, goes to work. All the employees see him. He's skipping in. He's whistling. He's happy. He said, I figured it out. I figured it out. What, what did you figure out? Well... I figured out the answer. What are you going to do? He said, well, we're going to get a big, big sign, a huge sign, and we're going to put it over the door. I said, how is that going to make a difference? Well, we're going to put a big sign over the door, and it's going to say, main entrance. <laughs> that was pretty smart, wasn't it? You know, good ideas come <laughs> come during uh, pressure a lot of times, as a necessity sometimes. And let's simply be honest, you and I learn things about the Lord and about ourselves and about our world and what we think is important when we face trials. If we didn't have those tough times, we wouldn't know how good God is. If we weren't lonely at times, we wouldn't really know what the real presence of the Lord is when he's with us, when he promises he would not leave us or forsake us. When all we have is just Jesus, we realize that all we need is Jesus. So this is a passage that I read tonight that is not my favorite. You know, uh, this wouldn't be very smart, but you know, probably if, if I was a person that had the Bible, I would probably tear that out of the Bible where it says... I tell you, brethren, count it all joy when you fall in the various trials. Count it joy when you fall in the various trials. That's not easy to do. It's not something I really want to do sometimes. 
where the Bible says it. So I first want to look at three truths, and then I want to talk about four responses that we could have to the passage. First, let me just say this. James, who was James? Brother of Jesus. And technically, half-brother of Jesus, right? So James, uh, the brother of Jesus, says, I'm a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, I'm a bond servant of my brother. Now, let me tell you, that would be really hard for me to say. My brother and I, we got in a few disagreements at times. Uh, some, of you, some of you might have heard of Clarence Cooper. He's a pastor, been in Mississippi for a long time, was president of the Mississippi Baptist Convention. He now pastors Brandon Baptist Church. Uh, he used to preach revivals for my dad. My dad was a preacher. You know those preacher boys are some of the worst around. So anyway, so but he, you know, even now, I'm 58. My brother's a little older than I am. Even when he sees us, he reminds us about the times when he would preach revivals. He'd be in there visiting with my dad, and we'd be rolling in the yard fighting each other. So it'd be mighty tough for me to say I'm a bond servant of my brother John. You know, it'd be really tough. But James wonderfully and gladly said it. <laughs> Why? Because when you look at a list of people that Jesus uh, visited after he was resurrected, it, there's a list of there, there are 500 people he visited at one time. Then there's a list of individuals. James is one of those individuals. He came and saw his brother, James, in a special visit. He said, hey, James, <laughs> I'm alive. And, and to think that James would say, you're my savior. You know, there was a time, if you remember reading the story one time, you remember Jesus was teaching in an area and his, his family was outside. And what were they saying? He's crazy, right? <laughs> they were saying, he's gone crazy. He's gone crazy. So I don't know if James was one of those saying that or not, but he, his family was saying it. But once he saw what Jesus did, he saw the love. He saw the love that, that Jesus showed on the cross. I heard Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. And, you know, all of this and then a special appearance. He could now say, this is not just my brother. <laughs> this is my Savior. And he called him a bond servant, which is a special kind of slave. And, and he was a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He called him his Lord. And then he was writing this to the tribes of the, the Jewish people, the, the tribes there scattered abroad. And so then he comes, he starts off with saying, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. They were being persecuted. And so what did joy mean? What is the, the definition of joy? Well, I read this, I have a disciple study Bible, and this is a good definition, I think. It says, the inner attitude of rejoicing in one's salvation, regardless of outward circumstances. Did you hear that? The inner attitude, this is joy. The inner attitude of rejoicing in one's salvation, regardless of outward circumstances. That's what James is telling us. Yes, it's tough, but you've got Jesus. Yes, you're facing death, <laughs> but you're saved. You've got Jesus. Count it joy. You can't be happy in those situations. You know, happiness is depending on the situation. You can't be happy when your house got blown away by the hurricane. You, you can't be happy. But you can have joy recognizing that Jesus has prepared you a place up in heaven that can withstand 140 mile an hour winds. <laughs> you can have joy in your salvation. Yes, we're walking through a valley of a shadow of death. It's scary at times. Shadows are scary. You might have heard me say this before, but the shadow of a bear can't maul you. The shadow of a lion can't hurt you. The shadow of a knife can't cut you. Now, it can scare you. Yes, it's scary. But for the Christian, death is just a shadow. And so he says, count it all joy. Even if you lose your job, you're still saved. And God's working out because what's it say? Uh, so the first truth I'd say, we can have joy during difficult times because we're saved. <laughs> the second thing that we would say here is that we must live according to God's timetable 
and prayerfully endure trials until he has completed his work. He who begun a good work in you, the Bible says. He who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until, until the day of Christ Jesus our Lord. And let's be honest, we have to go through those difficult times or he wouldn't be able to knock the rust off. He wouldn't be able to, for us to strengthen us. You know, I've, I've gone through some tough times. And if I didn't go through those, I wouldn't have prayed probably as much as I needed to. And it's, I hate to admit that. But when you face those tough times, what do you do? You turn to the Lord. You turn to those things that are eternal. And you realize how you place your faith in things that don't matter. You know, you're working so hard to please people that can't be pleased. But understand that, that God loves you just like you are. You can have joy. There are a lot of things out of our control. We're trying to control all these things. And we want to solve the trial and the problems. But just be joyful and understand that the battle belongs to the Lord. The Bible tells us over and over and over again. <laughs> the battle belongs to the Lord. So knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now who wants patience? I do, but I want it right now. <laughs> I want what I want when I want it. And I want it right now, right? Patience. You know... Don't mess up like I did one time and pray for patience. The Lord will give you plenty of opportunities to learn. <laughs> but knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, this idea of waiting on the Lord. We are in a society that doesn't want to wait. We want the answer. And if it doesn't work, we'll quickly do something else. I remember Jared when... <laughs> You know, Jared would ever always go fishing. Uh, the most a little frustrating. It was fun. And I just accepted it. I counted it joy when we go fishing. That Jared would cast uh, cast uh, this lure out there, reel it in, go change it, change it. You know, it takes five ten minutes. You know, then he'd cast it again. Something rolling. Oh, it's time. That's not working. Change it. He didn't wait, did he? <laughs> But, and before you knew that, he's swimming because the fish aren't biting. Yeah, they're sure not biting now. <laughs> so much fun. It was fun, you know. But we never caught any fish because you wouldn't wait. You know, you look at, at that, the, those champion bats, what do they do? They, they're going to work that worm all the way across, work it back. They're going to keep trying a little off more than once. But have patience because it produces, because he'll teach us something. And then verse 4, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Many of you have gone through some real trials. You know, I would say probably worse than, than I've I'm going through now or have even gone through. What are you learning? What is God teaching you? And we have to take the time to even ask God. It's okay to ask him. What are you up to, God? <laughs> we need to add that term, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. You know, you know, what are you saying, God? What are you trying to teach me? What, are you, what, what can I learn here? Because he's perfecting us. You know, throughout life, the idea of he who began a good work and you will be faithful to complete it the day of Christ Jesus, our Lord. You might have heard me share this before as well. But um, when my mother was dying, it was, she had Alzheimer's and uh, dementia and it, it was hard. But we were, we were very blessed. She, she didn't linger a long time. But, but I remember um, the last time our family gathered around her bed and we prayed for her. And you see her broken, not knowing where she is. And it's heartbreaking. Many of you have been there, and some of you recently. And I, It's not easy, I know. That's how we see our loved one. That's how we see our saved loved one. It's broken. But you know how heaven sees them? Just one more breath away from being perfect. 
they take that last breath, they're not hurting anymore. They're perfect. Through Christ, they're perfect. They walk through the valley of the shadow of death. They walk through that door. And of course, it's hard for us to find joy in that sometimes. But what, boy, we can't be sad for them, can we? <laughs> they are fulfilled now. They're in the presence of true love. They're in heaven where it's so bright that it says that the glory of Jesus lights up the place. Wow. Man, I'm jealous of my mom. She's in the presence of Jesus. But it takes patience sometimes to get to learn these lessons, to learn what he's teaching us. But we must live according to God's timeline. And what does the Lord's prayer say? You know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let him work his work. There's a fellow named R.U. Darby. Uh, he and his uncle, his uncle had discovered some gold back in one of the old uh, gold rushes. His uncle discovered some gold in Colorado, came back to the Northeast and uh, told uh, R.U. Darby about it. And they got their family to buy him some equipment and they take off to Colorado to drill. And they, they brought up uh, their first um, uh, wagon, or whatever you call it, uh, of, uh, of of ore and did some tests and yes this is very rich they were on to something and they started digging and they found a little bit of a, a little bit of a vein so they started making some money it wasn't enough to pay off all the the equipment yet but they were they were they were in business but then they started digging and they lost the vein of gold you know how the gold was kind of this vein and they lost it they couldn't find it they 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 drilled and drilled and drilled. They had lost it. And so they said, well, this is a waste of time. So they gave up. They sold their equipment for a few hundred dollars to a junk man, to the junkyard. Now, this guy at the junkyard, you, you know, was pretty smart. He went and hired an engineer because he knew these guys must have been on to something or they wouldn't have spent all the time that they did. So he went and hired an engineer and the engineer came in and looked and said, well, these guys, they just don't know a lot about fault lines, how the, how the, the, the stone cracks. They just don't know how to follow the fault lines. That's what you do to find the, the vein of gold. And the guy, the engineer estimated, I think if you deal this direction, you're probably going to find it. They drilled three feet and found the gold. The junk man became a millionaire. R.U. Darby and his uncle were three feet away, but they stopped. Now, R.U. Darby went on to be one of the most successful insurance salesmen uh, in the country. In the 1930s, he was in the top 50 of all insurance agents in the country. Uh, and so he learned a lesson. <laughs> he said, I'm never going to stop three feet short again. When someone tells me no, that they don't want a life insurance policy, I'm going to go ask somebody else. I'm never going to give up. And that, that, he's quoted as saying that. When someone tells me no, I'm just going to go to the next. I'm going to keep on going. And he, and he became very successful. He became a millionaire as well. You and I sometimes can get so close to what God's teaching us, but sometimes, you know, I'm honest, I'm that way too. We say, well, let me try something else. And that thing will make it worse. Let me try something or go to someone that doesn't really have the answer. Or, and it just gets worse. It gets very complicated. <laughs> but let God's work have its perfect work in us. And, and seek his wisdom. So we can live according to God's timeline and prayerfully endure trials until he has completed his work. Next we must trust God completely and not doubt his love. Verse 6 says... But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven, tossed, and tossed by the wind. 
For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. It's so easy for us to try to play both sides of the fence. To, you've heard of it. Uh, there's a song Casting Crowns sings. Uh, what if the church on Sunday would still be the church on Monday? <laughs> you know what I mean. You know, it's easy in church to be excited and maybe joyful about the Lord. But we should have the same faith when we face the world throughout the rest of the week. And so we can trust him. He can be trusted. And many of you could stand here tonight and give a testimony of God's faithfulness in difficult times. And yes, it hurt. But he has never left you. He's with you. So count it all joy. So when we face trials, just quickly, when we face trials, we, we have four responses I'm saying here. The first thing is we can rumble. What's a rumble? That's a gang fight. Mitch has been in several rumbles, I'm sure. You know what a, a rumble is? You just, let's fight, you know? And that's what we tend to do. We fight, we even fight against God or just, you know, we're going to make this happen. We're going to make this work. We're going to solve this pro- problem. The trial comes because somebody, somebody did something. So we're going to fix them. We're going to, how many people can you control or fix? I've never figured out how to do that. Most of the things in this world are out of our control. But we're going to fight and fight and make somebody do something or make somebody apologize or we're going to, you know, we can't do that. But that's a response, a rumble. But Proverbs 3, 11 through 12 says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as the father, the son in whom he delights. Things come into our life, and he can take that, and he can teach us and help us. So we can rumble. The second thing is we can stumble. We can allow the trials to trip us up and keep us from following Jesus. We can fall and just not get up. We can stumble. And then when we do that, a lot of times we can really blame God. Why is God doing this to me? You know, we, we blame God for... You know, why me? Everybody else is happy. I've heard that recently from somebody. Why am I the only one that this happens to? You're not. I promise you you're not. You know, uh, but get up and keep following Jesus. Have the, the patience to let him do the work that he's working in you. But we can stumble. We can rumble or stumble. You know, but Hebrews 10, 23 said, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is... Faithful? Yes. So we can rumble or stumble. We can grumble. You like the way these rhyme? (laughs) Boy, I had to really search for these in the thesaurus, you know. Anyway, rumble, stumble, grumble. Yeah, that's what we do. Question if God cares for us, whether he'll help us. Have a big pity party. Pity parties are no fun. The punch is always room temperature. At the pity party, the cake is always dry. Man, the potato chips are stale. No, no joke anyone tells is funny at all. The dead jokes aren't even funny. It's terrible. The pity parties are just no fun. You know what Helen Keller said? Some of you know Helen Keller. Many years ago, she was an American educator and advocate for the blind and deaf because she was blind and deaf. Born blind and deaf at an early age, at the age of two, Ann Sullivan came to her and began teaching her. It made her have incredible progress to be able to communicate. Helen Keller went to college and was the first blind and and deaf person to graduate with a bachelor's degree in 1904. She said, Helen Keller said, self-pity is our worst enemy, and if we yield to it, we can never do anything good in the world. Helen Keller said that. So we can rumble, stumble, or grumble. Philippians 2.14 says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Or we can humble. We can humble ourselves. Be teachable and ask the Lord for wisdom. He desires to teach us. Now, 
I've told you this isn't my favorite passage because some of this is kind of uncomfortable, but I found it to be true. When I just sit back and let the Lord have it and pray and get into the Word, He has the answers I need. Maybe not what I want, but what I need. Matthew 23, 12 says, And whoever exalts himself, exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Isaiah 29, 19 says, The humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. And James said in chapter 4, verse 10, James said, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Everyone has a choice. <laughs> I read this, not original with me. Everyone has a choice. We can be humble or be humbled. And I'm so glad that I'm around a lot of humble people. The reason you're here tonight is because you recognize in the middle of the week, you need to hear from the Lord. That we need each other. That we need encouragement. I need to see you. You need to see me. I need that handshake. I need that smile. I need your prayers. And, and we need to be humble enough to accept that. Some people just don't want anybody to help them. But that's the beauty of this church, I think, that we, we can lean on each other. We can count on each other. And we've got a great staff that models that. We, we can help each other. So count it joy. We've got Jesus, and then we've got each other. One of them is a knothead, but anyway, we we got some pretty good old folks around here. Isn't it great to be in the family of God? And, and just understand that um, he cares about you. And he's working a work in you, and he's not going to stop until he's finished. Let's pray once more. God, thank you.